Hello everyone, we are back with episode two with Piedri Riedlingais, the founder of Verena Capital. And today we're going to look at some charts. We're going to look at some Bitcoin charts. We're going to look at some other stock and company charts. So stay tuned till the end. Hope you find some value. Please consider liking and subscribing. It really goes a long way. And uh, yeah, Petri, great to have you back. Thank you. Please take us through some of these interesting charts with, you know, all these various interesting companies and cryptos and, and all of that, because I know you want to explain a chart. So we'd, we'd love to, first of all, see how you, you actually analyze a chart and second of all, your opinion on, on these different uh, aspects. So you, you want to kick off with, with Bitcoin? Or with uh, okay, yeah, we can do that. So, um, so I'm going to be looking in this direction. Uh, because that's where my screen is. There's a couple of things. I think it. I think there's a couple of things when it comes to looking at uh, charts. Is that you have to kind of. I mean, every different instrument type is a little different to. Um, you know, the, I don't know. I, I prefer to use certain things to chart. Uh, so, for example, when I look at the S&P, I like to use uh, ETFs. Um, and uh, if I look. You know, at cryptocurrencies, I like to use uh, a different sort of chart setup rather than um, what I would normally use to look at stocks, if that makes sense. So if you're looking at crypto, for example, here, so I'm just using TradingView, um, which is great. Um, I think actually, and I'm not sure, I'll check, but I might have a um, like a discount code or something from TradingView. That we can people want to people want to use it. I don't know, whatever. Um, so with with uh, with the crypto stuff, what I prefer to do is I like to look at weekly charts rather than daily charts, and I like to use a logarithmic uh, scale. So I'll show you the difference that the log scale makes to a normal scale, right? If you just do a normal price scale, that's what you get. You've got these huge <laughs> moves. Is where if you put that in a log scale it sort of uh, normalizes that out a bit. So what this does is it sort of changes um, the way that the, the, the chart is plotted, right? So here, the difference between, uh, you know, six and eight, for example, is the same as the difference distance between eight and 12. So it kind of increases the, um, uh, it keeps percentage based rather than uh, sort of absolute dollar base, you know? So from 200 to 400 is 100% increase. Uh, and but from 400 to 800 is also 100 percent increase. So that distance is double. But if you do use a log chart, then that sort of is a more fair representation. So it's a bit easier, more rational, I think, to look at these things. Now, what it does mean is that you could see a relatively small move from 3000 to 5000. Um, you know, if you were to put that on a normal scale, that is a that is a colossal move, right? But um, percentage based, it's not necessarily outside of what it's done in the past. So it's a bit easier for me to use the logarithmic type um, sort of axes when looking at uh, the cryptocurrencies, just because they move so much more. And I think also, uh, in, as a general tip, if you're looking at longer time frames, so if you're looking at 20 years or 10 years worth of data, a logarithmic chart is going to help sort of normalize that chart a little bit because, uh, you know, just a quick, like the percentage from one to two is 100% increase, from two to three is a 50% increase, from three to four is 25% or, you know, 33% increase. So um, giving those an equal amount of space on the chart is not necessarily accurate. So you want to represent, you want a chart that represents the percentage moves slightly better and that's what the log chart does so anyway so you ethereum uh then what i've also got on here is 126 week um 126 week moving average right in particular these two the cryptos that i that i chart i chart on the bitstamp exchange for a few reasons one the bitstamp exchange is the exchange that i actually use uh for offshore stuff uh when it comes to to uh, crypto they've been around for very long and they've also got a very liquid uh, book, right? So there's a lot of volume that trades through them. Uh, I mean, Coinbase and, and the like might be a little bit bigger, but uh, Bitstamp is the one that I that I prefer to use. I also find that the price is sometimes, um, particularly with stuff like Bitcoin, maybe 10 or $20 cheaper <laughs> on Bitstamp than what it is on something like Coinbase. And that's just obviously supply and demand. There's a bit of arbitrage there. If you can build a bot, it can do it fast enough. But, um, but yeah, in any case, so 
nice 126 week uh, moving average on a weekly chart. This gives us a good idea of what the what the general sort of um, trend is. So at the moment, obviously the trend is up. Um, and it uh, normalizes this chart quite a bit rather than looking like something like that. We see something like this rather. So I guess the first thing that you'll notice when it comes to these cryptos in general is that the outlook is relatively longer term. And I'm not trying to trade these things minute by minute or day by day. Uh, I'm taking longer term sort of weekly views and trying to really um, catch bigger moves over longer periods of time than try to, um, you know, oh, it's moved $200. Yay, I've made or lost a fortune. Like, I'd rather take a smaller position, be in the thing for a 30 or 50 or 80 percent move uh, than be involved in it for the very short term, I think. A lot of the time people want to trade. This is a discussion we were having among some of the clients the other day. Um, you know, consistency does not necessarily mean that you're trading every single day or in and out five times a day. Um, a lot of people enter into the market and want to start trading and it's very exciting and you feel like if you're not trading, you're not doing anything. It's a good quote. Um, you know, the really good traders don't look for trades. They see trades, if that makes sense. Right? You see an opportunity, you don't necessarily go out looking for something because then often you're, you're forcing a situation rather than um, uh, then actually seeing what is out there to be had. So in any case, so with, uh, with Ethereum at the moment, this little, this little uh, candle here, I'll draw a line around it. This little candle here is looking like a little bit bearish actually. So that's a hanging man, uh, that's a hanging man formation there. So if this week's candle closes at the bottom here. We may actually see a short term pullback, maybe back down to this 2040 level. Uh, this was a previous high. We can see that it's been relatively well supported. It did sort of trade below that a few times, a few scares here to, you know, sub 1700. But this has been a relatively strong sort of support zone, if you will. Um, this little area here has been a relatively strong support zone. So if it gets back down there, I'd be happy to accumulate. I do think um, Ethereum is, you know, I guess driven as many of the other cryptos are by what's happening in Bitcoin. Um, so I think that this is, uh, you know, if we do get an opportunity to buy more here, uh, I'd be quite happy to take it. At the moment, I am long, um, you know, in various different places, if you will. Uh, so I'm just patiently waiting and I think the key with these things are and something that I think is very, very important for most people to remember is leverage on cryptos is go going to kill you, right? Um, yes, you know, Bitcoin was at a couple of hundred bucks a few years ago and yes, you missed the bus and blah, blah, blah and all that stuff. But leveraging yourself 100 to 1 on Bitcoin now or Ethereum now is just is crazy, right? Don't, don't do it. I mean, if this thing drops from 3000 to 2000 that's a thousand and fifty dollars um you know multiply that by a hundred and you can do serious damage to yourself and yeah you can buy a lambo if it goes up but it's not worth losing your house for it right um so be very very careful uh anyway in general i think that we've got uh, uh sort of in the shorter term a very nice uh little uptrend situation happening here uh as long as this trend line does not break um we should be, we should remain bullish. I would also consider this 2040 level as a buy. Um, I'm just a patient hodler, if that makes sense. I do have a theorem that I'll run you through on uh, um, Bitcoin now uh, that I think is going to do relatively well over the next couple of years. Well, next couple of months rather. Um, but if you look at, I'm gonna go back in time, back in time. So if we just look at, and again, this is a log chart, right? So if we look at sort of the uh, uh, the way that this has moved, and okay, unfortunately, the data only starts here in 2011, so we don't have a full picture. But if you look at the way that this thing's moved, so 2012, 2013, uh, we had this little push to $200. Then we have, um, you know, 2013 was doing relatively well. We pushed all the way to, what is this, $1,200. At the time, this was, the highest that it had ever been, right? We pushed all the way to about $1,200 uh, a, a Bitcoin here. And this was absolute madness. I remember this this time, particularly this 
last quarter of uh, of sort of 2013, it was just, it was on Bloomberg, it was on YouTube, everybody was talking about Bitcoin, 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 right? Um, which I don't think, I mean, we had a little bit of that at the beginning of the year, but not quite as much as, uh, as I think we're, we're going to have. Right? Um, in any case, then we have this uh, uh, bit of a consolidation phase, the bubble pops, bang, 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 the stock or the, the thing falls all the way back down um, to here, uh, 150. Now, that doesn't look major. So let me, let me do this because we're using a logarithmic chart. I'm going to do this. Take my log chart off. Bang. So there's perspective for you, right? You have this thing trading at $6, $5, $3, and it pumps to 1,200 almost. I mean, that is huge. So now the log chart normalizes that a lot, so it's a lot less sexy, but um, this is obviously the one that, that made the rounds at the time. Then you've got a fall all the way to basically $150. So you look at this thing, and I'm a big believer in uh, just plain old plain patterns repeating themselves, right? So you look at this, it is 87% that it fell, right? That it crashed in the space of 2014, in space of a year, boom, right? Um, so now obviously, you know, Bitcoin is dead, failed project, blah, 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 all that junk. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, I guess it's nothing new. We've got a bit of a consolidation then for a space of a year. So we kind of go sideways. I mean, you can see here it doubled uh, in price in a space of a year. Um, and then come 2017 or 2016, sorry, it sort of goes back to the previous highs, right? Boom. Now suddenly 2017, people sit up and take note of it again. And people start talking about it and it makes the news and blah, 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 Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Can you believe it? You know, um, until we get to about here where we're now double with the previous time at around the middle of the year, right? Um, and also note, here's your previous peak. So we've got one year, two year, three year, in the fourth year. Now there's a few things happening here. I'm not going to show this in the chart because I don't don't necessarily uh, have it on a chart, but um, every four years, the mining um, reward halves, right? So the mining reward halves sort of late 2016, and you get this pump, right? And eventually early 2017, late 2016, early 2017, we take out the previous highs and okay, a bit of a dump, but now suddenly it's on everybody's radar again and they start talking about it. It's on the news and it's this and it's that. And boom, it hit 3000, man, it's double what it was. Like, can you believe that? Um, obviously crazy volatility. And then come the second half uh, of um, 2017, things just go absolutely nuts. Right, there we go, all the way up to 20,000. And again, we're looking almost at the same chart as we were when we were looking at the 2011 to 2014 section, right? Okay, on a log chart, again, not so sexy. On this uh, normal chart, it just looks absolutely nuts. So this is a 4,600% rally, right? Um, which is pretty crazy. So obviously, Bitcoin mania is kind of at its peak late 2017, and pop, 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 the bubble, she pops, right? And we trade all the way down in a space of a year, all the way back down, again to 20, to, over a space of a year, and again we have 85, 84.5%. So now, so it's exactly the same. So it was like 84% the first time and 85. It was 87. Yeah, it was 87. But I mean, let's let's call it 85. Let's call it 85% to be safe or 80% to be safe. Now, okay, we don't have data going back before this, but remember, Bitcoin was, I mean, it had no value at all, right? And then it went to like, I don't know, what was $40? How much was two large pizzas? I don't know. Somebody paid 40,000 Bitcoin for that, right? And suddenly it's on the map. So if you look pre-2011 as well, because it started in 2009, we had a similar pump and then collapse and then pump and then collapse. And then this is the third one, pump and then collapse. Um, 
And now we're going to go back. Now we again have a year long sort of consolidation where it doubles in price and halves, doubles and halves a few times in this process. Right. And we have this consolidatory period um, and then we sort of reach year three right in the cycle in our four year cycle. So we have our our halving takes place in this year and the halving is enough to create a bit of a supply shock to get it above 20,000 and suddenly it's on everybody's radar again. Right. So um, here we start. Da, 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 da. Everybody's talking Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. Um, and we're sort of double the previous price, slightly higher than double the previous price by mid year. By another correction, just like it was last time. So here we were double the previous price in a correction. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where we're at. So, so what do I think? What do I, I think? I think yeah, it's yeah. 4,000 or so percent. Let's say we get half of the size of the rally as the previous time. So where would that put Bitcoin's price? It's, it's currently around what, $48,000? Yeah. So that would put it around, my price target is $200,000. By when? December. That's, that's quite a big increase. Yeah, that's a brave call. <laughs> yeah, also, it's one that I made many years ago, right? So I have to be honest there and say, like, uh, when this uh, when this uh, bubble popped here, 2017, when this thing came down, um, I think it was May. I'd written an, uh, an article for Finweek that was published in May, and I basically said, look, this thing's going to come down 85%, um, and it's in this four-year cycle, and it's going to pump. And at that point, I put the $200,000 uh, price target on. So uh, there's no escaping. I can't, you know, I can't turn around and say, look, uh, it's not going to, so, it's not going to happen. If, but let's say theoretically it happens. So just for everyone watching, it's a prediction nobody can predict. But uh, there you have it. So you, you, it thinks it can go to two hundred thousand dollars by December. But let's say it happens theoretically. Mm. Will there become another eighty-five percent crash if it repeats the cycle or what? Yes. So, so um, there's a couple of interesting things. I think. Uh, Moore's law uh, is one, um, not Moore's law, Metcalf's law is what it's called, right? So what is one fax machine worth? Nothing. One person on earth is a fax machine. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Fax yourself, right? Now give a hundred million people a fax machine. The value of a fax machine becomes um, exponential. It becomes almost invaluable because it's your, your communication like a cell phone one cell phone alone is worthless but billions of people have cell phones and if you have their number you can contact them and you can generate you can build empires of cell phones you can overthrow countries of cell phones you can do all sorts of things a cell phone's value is almost invaluable in the hands of the person who's wielding the tool right but in the beginning cell phones had no value because there was only one right so Essentially, the value of the fax machine or the cell phone is not necessarily, and this is also the value of the telecommunications company like MTN, <laughs> Vodacom and those labs, uh, is not so much the value of the asset, but rather the, the utility of that asset. So the more users start using cell phones, the more valuable cell phones become to the users. Right? So the same thing. The more people start using cryptocurrencies, and NFTs and all sorts of crazy junk like that, the more valuable it becomes because the more useful it comes, the more utility there is. So that I think is one of the drivers behind what uh, uh, sort of, you know, what the value of these cryptocurrencies are. I think that, um, you know, over the next, like if you think about what, what crypto is supposed to, you know, attempt to achieve is a finite money supply. Um, where central banking has been built on this concept of infinite money supply. Every time we run out of uh, uh, money or whatever the case is, or oh, the world seizes up, what do the central banks do? <laughs> the printers in the basement runs. So, um, you know, that creates things like inflation, a whole bunch of things. The value of money is deteriorating over time. Um, crypto is supposedly the opposite of that right um where there is only so many coins that'll ever be made and yes a crypto bitcoin is divisible by 100 million so you can have one 100 millionth 
of a Bitcoin and there's 21 million of them. So there's plenty to go around if you start thinking in the smallest possible denominations. Um, yeah, and I just, I, I just honestly, I think that um, as time goes by, people will start using them more and more and more uh, for applications we can't even really consider now. For example, um, you can program an individual portion or Satoshi or whatever you want to call it of a Bitcoin to only be acceptable at certain merchant times. So let's say, for example, uh, and obviously there's a huge amount of development that will be necessary for this, but let's say, for example, I pay you a salary of, uh, you know, one Bitcoin a month and, um, you know, that Bitcoin is obviously divisible into certain pieces, but I can say 70% of that or 10% of that funds uh, that I pay your salary to must go towards education for your kids. You can't physically cannot spend it at a bottle store. You physically cannot spend it at the movies. It is for education or medical or whatever the case is. Um, ah, that is a bit Orwellian and a bit scary telling people how they can and cannot spend their money. But it also opens the opportunities for other people. Like, for example, the guy who has a history of drug abuse and was a was a, a convict can't get a job. Well, now you can pay him and you can know for a fact that he can't spend his money on alcohol because it's not acceptable there, right? Um, so all sorts of stuff. I think it's going to be really very interesting how this stuff um, develops. And I think that over time, the value that, um, you know, fiat money and, and the dollar and that kind of stuff is going to lose is sort of going to be absorbed by a lot of these cryptocurrencies. I'm not saying go out and bet the farm on it. I'm not saying it's the end of capitalism and the way that the world works at the moment. It's a hundred year experiment. It's going to take another another hundred years before we really know what the value is. And and the thing is, if you think that's a long time, well, central banking's only been around for like 200 years. So yes, it is a long time, but it's actually not, right? Um, so, ah, yeah, it's interesting, yeah, interesting I think, time to be alive. Uh, with, with crypto, it, with everything in life, nobody can predict the future. Who knows what tomorrow holds? Um, we, we can all make, you know, our, our re do our research and try and understand it the best possible. So there you have it, everyone. Uh, Petri's target price for Bitcoin is 200000 by <laughs> end of this year. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, like I said, it's, it's predictions. Um, and uh, this is by, if you're looking at the previous patterns, so if you are someone that, that you know follows and, and likes patterns, this is probably then for you. If not, you know, let us know what, what do you think is the future of Bitcoin. We'd love to hear in the comments and, and what do you think of that price target? Uh, it is quite ambitious, um, but uh, let's let's see what happens. It's, crypto is definitely a massive, massive concept, and if it plays out, it's it's quite uh, interesting. Yeah, let's see. Eh? Hopefully, I don't I don't die. Yeah. Um,